Welcome to worship here at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. My name is Pastor Eric, and we're so glad you've joined us here online. We hope you'll feel welcome as we worship together. I want to share with you a few announcements from our community here at Holy Trinity before we continue. First of all, we want to say a happy birthday and celebrate with member Betty Nelson as she celebrated her 100th birthday just the week before last. If you want to send her a birthday greeting, you can send it to the church and we'll forward it on to her over at University Village. You can read more about her life in the bulletin attached to our email that we sent out with this worship link. Also, please note that with some hard things going on in our world, our Lutheran Church is at work. There are ways you can give through Lutheran Disaster Response to help with the situation in Haiti. So you can find that at the back of your bulletin, again, in attached to the email. With the situation in Afghanistan, we are also looking to help out a local Afghan refugee family. You can do so by uh, buying car seats, and we'll donate them through the Women of Faith Interfaith Service. So please note that the announcement is also in the attached bulletin to the email with a worship service link. And finally, please note that we continue to serve meals through Harbor House and through our location here at Holy Trinity. In the past, you may recall that our church sponsored one of those nights by cooking meals and bringing them in to serve. We're trying to get back into that habit again. The exact night will probably be towards the end of the month. If you're interested in bringing a meal, please contact the church office or the coordinator, June Slatham, at her email, juneslatham at gmail.com. They'll give you more information about how you bring your food in and when to do it so we can serve those in need in our community. We continue now with our opening song. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship your Lord.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside, and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may be preserved through your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with our first reading from Scripture. The first reading is from the book of James, the first chapter. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious, and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts. Their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
is from the book of Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you, hypocrites. As it is written, The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Jesus is not talking about matters of hygiene as he criticizes the religious leaders in today's gospel from Mark. Instead, he is talking about spiritual matters or matters of the heart. The hand washing that Jesus is referring to comes from a tradition where the ancient priests of Israel were called to purify themselves before they entered into the holy place of God. In Exodus chapter 30, the Bible says that the Lord told Moses, you shall make a bronze basin with a stand for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. With the water, Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. When they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar, or to make an offering to the Lord, they shall wash with water. Although this law first applied only to the priests who went to the altar, later on there were religious movements like the Pharisees who took such laws and began applying them to all of the Jewish people. They were calling all believers to the same kind of ritual cleanliness as the priest had. The washing of hands then was not so much about just washing to get the dirt off, but rather it was a religious practice to symbolize purifying oneself before God in preparation to meeting the Lord. Such practices can be good for centering the soul and getting one into a mindset of worship. However, the rituals are a tool. They're not an end in themselves. They can be helpful in getting a person to focus, but it is what comes out of a person's heart that really matters. A ritual is just an empty symbol if it does not actually influence a person's motivations. This is why Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah as he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus points out, it is hypocritical for the religious leaders to be criticizing his disciples for not doing the ritual hand washing when they themselves are not following all of God's commands. Jesus is trying to show that they are missing the point by overly focusing on the physical ritual as opposed to how the spirit of the person is being affected and whether or not they are actually living out of their beliefs. A little bit of physical dirt on people's hands or on their food 
is not going to defile them. It is the attitudes of their hearts which will make them impure and negatively affect their actions. Jesus goes through a list of sins and bad behaviors that result from the inner motivations of people. This includes things such as slander and theft, envy, deceit, and other wickedness, things that can come out of our hearts. The bad news, then, that Jesus delivers today is that we have met the enemy and they are us. Jesus reveals the depth of human depravity. He reveals that much of the world's wickedness lies within ourselves, and it's not just a simple thing to wash it off. At the same time, you might say the good news is that Jesus calls out the kind of religious hypocrisy that would put on a nice face but does not actually lead to real change in attitude or behavior. He levels the playing field between the people and those who think they are morally better or those who tend to judge or condemn others because, well, they're not doing the correct religious rituals. By expanding the notion of what makes someone pure or able to approach God to include matters of the heart or the intention of the spirit, Jesus also expands the notion of who can be included in God's grace. We see how this plays out in the story in the Gospel of Mark that follows the text from today. In this passage, Jesus is outside of his home territory when he encounters a Syrophoenician woman. Although she is of a different culture and different country, she approaches Jesus and asks her for him for help in healing her daughter. Jesus hesitates because the woman is a Gentile. She is therefore unclean or not of the pure Jewish faith. Her persistence moves Jesus, however, as well as her love for her child and the trust she has that Jesus can actually do something to help. She may not be technically pure in the religious sense, according to the tradition, but Jesus seems to see within her a purity of heart that connects him to her. He decides to respond to her request and to heal her daughter. It is interesting to me how the woman in the story reacts to the situation she and her daughter are in. From the sounds of it, things were not looking good for their family. The daughter had some kind of demon inside her, we're told. We do not get the specifics of what that actually means, but I think it's probably safe to assume that this situation has brought confusion and shame upon their family. This has probably strained the relationship between daughter and mother, not to mention the relationship between the rest of the family or their friends and their neighbors. What has gone into the woman is a sense of anger, hurt, and pain from her situation, which may have led then to feelings of hopelessness or fear. Yet, that those feelings are not what come out of the woman. Instead, the woman seems hopeful in this encounter and confident that Jesus can help. She shows courage in approaching Jesus and remains persistent even when he appears to dismiss her at first. The woman is not angry at Jesus or angry at God. Instead, she seems trusting and faithful. All that emotional stress and anxiety that was going into her as a mother could have, you might say, defiled her. It could have twisted her heart and embittered her soul. Somehow, though, her spirit was resilient, and what came out of her was a sense of hope and courage. It is this kind of sense of resiliency that helps me to feel not so hopeless or discouraged when I hear news like what is happening 
in Afghanistan. We've been hearing reports and watching images the last two weeks of desperate people trying to flee the country because of the recent takeover of the Taliban. The mass evacuation has led to horrific scenes of people crowding one another, even trampling over each other on their way to get out. This last week, the scenes got worse with a bombing and the death of American military members, along with many Afghan civilians. The situation is leading to a humanitarian crisis with thousands of people now becoming refugees. Such news is incredibly sad and disheartening. There's so much pain and trauma that is going into those who are involved in this crisis. Yet there may be glimpses of hope for those who manage to get out. Now I say this because I have heard stories like the one I want to share with you today. A story of a local refugee from Thousand Oaks who fled from another war, the war in Syria. Rama Youssef was a sixth grader in Damascus when Syria's deadly and destructive civil war erupted in 2011. For a year, she lived in a war zone, passing through checkpoints under the watchful eye of armed militia and growing accustomed to the sound of gunfire in the distance. When bombs started to fall closer to Youssef's school, her mom finally decided it was time for them to flee. It was really horrific and only getting worse, she said. We were scared. She came to the United States to live with her older sister, who was married to a Syrian-American in San Diego. With her mother still seeking asylum in Germany, her father still trapped in Syria, Yusuf settled into her new country alone without knowing a word of English, in many ways like an orphan. Now 21, Yusuf said she largely raised herself, first in Southern California and then in Portland, Oregon. When her high school in Oregon put on a college fair, she felt drawn to California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks. She had one question for the CLU representative, however, on the phone. Do you consider people like me? The rep assured her that her refugee status wouldn't hinder her prospects. She applied even though she was unsure how she could pay for it, even if she got in. To her surprise, her application was accepted, and she was awarded CLU's first ever International Leaders Scholarship, essentially a full ride covering the cost of tuition and fees. When she called to tell her parents, they wept for joy. With so many hopes that they've lost over the years because of the war and how we all got separated, that's the best news we've heard for a long time, she said. My dad started crying, and I have never seen him cry. Yusuf's scholarship was made possible through CLU's participation in the Institute for International Education's Consortium for Syrian Higher Education in Crisis. The association connects Syrian students whose education was disrupted as a result of the war to a network of over 80 different U.S. universities. CLU joined this group after a recent graduate, Kelly Warren, urged the university to connect with the consortium and do more to help refugees. Ms. Warren, who graduated from CLU in 2017, said she'd been touched by images of the unfolding crisis in Syria. She has spent the past few years contributing in small ways like donating to relief organizations, but she felt called to do something more. This seemed like such an effective way to make an impact, she said. Even if it's just one or two refugees at a time, it's an important thing for someone to say, you can come here, you can be safe, you can have a change in your life. Dane Raleigh, CLU's Director of International Admissions, said that Yusuf was selected for the scholarship because of her fortitude in the face of such dire circumstances. The biggest thing in her incredible in is her incredible enthusiasm, he said. Her enthusiasm for learning and for her future. 
and the resilience she has had. That's clear when you first start talking with her. She's overcome both global as well as personal setbacks. Yusuf has recently written a book about her story called A Rose from War and is looking to get it published. The most important part of her book is to educate readers about the background of Middle Eastern women, especially ones migrating for a better life. What went into Rama Yusuf as a child were the horrors and the traumas of war. And yet, what came out of her life is a hope for the future and the courage to tell her story, to raise awareness and to help other refugees. Jesus tells us today that it is what comes out of us that counts. We may wrestle with sin in our hearts and our inner souls might be impure. But when the love of God comes in, we become purified by God's grace. We can become people then who are hearers and doers of God's word. We can become people who seek to care for the most vulnerable in our midst, like the widows and the orphans. We can become persistent in our prayer and trust that Jesus can bring signs of healing even in the most dire of circumstances. Amen.
invite you now to join me as we profess our faith through the words of the ancient Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, and he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, for the world, and for all those who are in need. We pray for the church, that it is a safe haven for all who seek your presence. Fill it with pastors, deacons, and leaders who echo your expansive and generous welcome. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the whole church of creation, that plants and animals and have habitat and resources to thrive and flourish. Inspire us to protect threatened habitats and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for individuals in positions of authority. Raise up wise and discerning leaders in federal, state, and local governments and guide them to seek the benefit of every person. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are in need. Support and encourage those who are unemployed, underemployed, or experiencing poverty. Bring food, shelter, clothes, and stability for daily life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation, especially those beginning a new school year, empower teachers and school administrators, guide students in their learning and development, accompany parents, foster parents, and caregivers, provide encouragement and love. We pray especially for those newly added to our prayers this week. For healing strength for Nina Wong's daughter, Stephanie, and son-in-law, Tyson. For Patty Sheenham. For Debbie Lindgren. For the families of the U.S. service members who lost their lives in Afghanistan this week. For the families of the Afghan civilians who lost their lives. And for our personal prayers we offer to you, silently or spoken out loud. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the faithful departed who showed us how to honor God with our heart. Inspire us by their example and renew our faith, trusting that we will be united with them in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. But you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer together. We'll be using the more contemporary version. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive a blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.